So Dr. Janaki Deepak, um, she was one of my close friends and, and colleagues doing residency at Harbor Hospital. Uh, she's um, uh, agreed to do grand rounds this morning, and we'll be talking about smoking liberation myths and facts. So a little bit about Dr. Deepak. She's currently a pulmonary and critical care physician at the University of Maryland. She's an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and assistant program director in the Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellowship Department, also director of the Lung Cancer Screening and Tobacco Health and Treatment Program. So she started a journey in medicine at the Sheth GS Medical College, University of Mumbai, India, and she completed a residency in uh, diagnostic radiology. She then completed her internal medicine residency at Harbor Hospital, where I was uh, a co-resident along with her and chief resident. Um, and then she went on to complete a fellowship at the Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine Department at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Deepak also has been heavily involved in the local Maryland ACP chapter, where she's been running Doctor's Dilemma as well as Students' Doctor's Dilemma competition. And she just recently was chosen to win the uh, Herbert S. Waxman Award for Outstanding Medical Student Educator from the National ACP uh, chapter. So today, uh, welcome, Dr. Deepak, and uh, thank you for agreeing to doing Grand Rounds this morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Kunkun and Dr. Thomas, for uh, inviting me to speak here. And Dr. Kunkun, everything I learned about teaching, I learned at your footsteps because Dr. Kunkun was definitely my resident, but also my mentor and how well to teach. Though I never adopted his teaching style, I've been trying, but he's just such a sweet teacher and I am the fiery teacher on the other hand. So thank you so much for your kind introduction. I have no conflicts of interest, except I am passionate about it. So um, there's going to be, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the historical aspects and then focus a lot on the effect of nicotine on the brain, which I think that we just don't do enough. And that's why we get misled on how we deal with patients with tobacco use disorder. Uh, a little bit, just a little bit on the electronic nicotine device systems. I know you all have had a grand rounds on that, so I'm not going to wax lyrical about it. Uh, a bit about what is motivational interviewing and counseling, whether that's enough, and, and then treatment, the actual treatment, and then some of the medication myths, a little bit about COVID-19 and smoking and also vaping. And I have some unpublished data from our clinic and some take home points. Okay, so let's go into a case and I want you all to keep this case scenario in mind as we are going through this entire presentation. So this is a 65 year old man, new diagnosis of squamous cell cancer, stage 2B, uh, which means that he has lymph nodes, which usually are N1 lymph nodes. And the treatment for stage 2B is usually surgery with chemotherapy afterwards. Uh, he has tobacco use disorder with ongoing use. He has about a uh, 40 pack year history of smoking. Uh, he presents to clinic for optimization of his pulmonary status prior to surgery. His FEV1 is 34% predicted and FEV1 FEC ratio is 40. So for the, uh, for the trainees out there, the fact that the FEV1 FEC ratio is 40, it means that we have obstruction. The FEV1 is 34%, which means we have severe obstruction. And then the DLCO being 35% usually means severe defect in gas transfer. In addition to the management of his smoking related lung disease, what are the other interventions that's going to be helpful at this time? Discussing with the patient about setting a quit date for stopping smoking. And I want you all to all truly write down your things in chat so that, you know, it's, it's not about commitment or getting something wrong. It's about how you feel about it and hopefully I can change your mind about it. Um, motivational interviewing and referral to tobacco counseling. Uh, offering the patient nicotine patch or varnaclin, which is called Shantix. And there is Epovarnaclin, which is uh, again, generic form of varnaclin from uh, Canada. And uh, discuss with the patient about tobacco addiction and prescribe controller, which could be any of those patch, varnaclin or bupropion and a reliever medication. So uh, I'll give you all like a couple of seconds to kind of commit to something on chat and then we'll move ahead. So I'm hoping to see some chat messages pop up. One person has braved it. Come on, two, 
Awesome. Awesome. Let's get to 10. Come on. We can do this. It's early morning. We got a coffee. We can do this. Yeah, in case people didn't tell you, I'm also very energetic. So if I'm over energetic, I apologize. Got it. Six, seven. Let's do it. Let's do it. We have not even reached. We have reached about what? 10 percent now. Yeah. More than 10 percent. Let's get to 10 and then we'll move. No. OK, that's it. Seven. OK, so hopefully people will take their time and do it. So let's go to the history. It's fascinating how actually we are in today's situation. Uh, so how did it start? There were traces of nicotine uh, discovered in Mayan flask um, dating more than 1000 years BC. Uh, nicotine, tobacco, as we know it now, actually came from the Native Americans or uh, the, the American Indians, and they used it, as you can see, they're waxing lyrical about how good uh, medicine it is, and this is in 1590. So what happened is when Columbus discovered America, he also took these tobacco leaves and spread it everywhere in Europe. Europe never had it before that. And then that's how it actually went to Europe. So it's a very interesting journey if you see how tobacco went from the Americas to everywhere else. And though it was existing in other places, like there is enough of Indian um, mythology, which talks about forms of tobacco. And uh, it is definitely there in South American uh, literature, but that's how it went to Europe. And then here is James the first, who basically had his counter blast to tobacco, where he said that it's, it's, it's horrible. I mean, he, he was clearly racist, I'm sorry. But in some things that he said, it's loathsome to the eye, harmful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs. He was absolutely correct, absolutely correct. This was way back when, and he was absolutely correct. You can see it's 1604. But we have still not realized it, unfortunately. So tobacco is a name for the plants of the nicotina family or the nightshade family. It's actually a pesticide in case you all don't know. Uh, the English word tobacco came from the uh, Spanish and Portuguese word tobacco. Uh, it's also used, uh, it's manufactured from tobacco leaves, cigars, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, vaping devices, hookah, snuff, pipe, chewing tobacco. And in 1560, Jean Nicot, the French ambassador to Portugal, brought it to England and France from Columbus. And as you can see, it was Nicot. And a lot of the nicotine comes from there too. So. This is our public enemy number one, Philip Morris International, who has this beautiful diagram on how it gets blended to the best product in the world. Political influences, a lot of it. So let's think about what we've done. So in 1612, Englishman and husband of Pocahontas, uh, all of you who have kids have hopefully seen Pocahontas, planted the best Indian tobacco in Jamestown. And in 1617, when there was a, you know, the new governor came there, he said, everything else is bad, but the signs of success is everywhere there's tobacco. And then to the colonists, it became a legal currency in Maryland and Virginia. So we are very much culprits in this. And this led to the growth of seven to 35% of Chesapeake regions and slave population. So there is a big, backdrop to this, and it's very sad. Uh, reports of cancer has been there for quite some time. Uh, I just love all these old diagrams. It's beautiful to see these journals. And then they talked about lung cancer. Uh, Morgagni talked, Morgagni of Morgagni's hernia talked about lung cancer quite some time ago. Okay, so what did we do? We did a lot of fake news. We said it cures asthma. Okay, we said so doctors smoke cigarettes, there's scientific effects and it's best for you. And dentists said it's good for you. And everyone said it's good for you. And then we tell now our patients that it's not good for you. So no wonder they don't want to believe us. Um, oh my God, I forgot that I'd done this, sorry. And then we did not spare our soldiers. We gave it to them and we said, what do you need? General John Pershing said, what do you need to win the war? 
is a cigarette in every soldier's hand. And there it was, cigarette in every soldier's hand. And then the Marlboro man, who all of you know about, but guess what? He never, ever smoked. He died, I think, two years ago. He was 89 years old. He never smoked. So there have been enough things. Thankfully, in 1964, there was a Surgeon General report said that this is really bad. In 2019, there was more. And this time we had uh, talking about e-cigarette use for the first time. All of you know about this. I'm not going to belabor the point. It does cause a lot of bad damage. It's known thing. So let's talk a little bit about addiction criteria. Addiction primary criteria is highly controlled compulsive use, psychoactive effects, and drug reinforced behavior. So now let's deal with nicotine addiction. So nicotine dependence is a chronic relapsing disorder. It has cycles of compulsive cigarette smoking. It is followed by periods of abstinence resulting in withdrawal. So it is an addiction. It's also a chronic health disorder as I'm hoping to convince you. So why do people smoke? So I have this picture of this man who's on oxygen. He blew himself up, he blew his house up. Why do they do it? Like, you know, why? They know it's bad for them. It's not like they don't know it. So the magic happens in the brain. The magic happens in the ventral tegmental area, it happens in the nucleus accumbens, and it's all because of this nicotine. So it hijacks the survival instinct. So what do I mean by hijacking the survival instincts? I mean that, my God, that was like going on and on. Um, so it, the unique, Thing about nicotine compared to any other product of addiction is that not only it acts on the ventral tegmental area, which is responsible for the safety and threat cues from the environment, right? So we are, we know as a child, we teach our children, don't go and put your hand on fire, don't cross the road without looking both sides. If there is a car coming, you step back. These are things we teach people and it becomes instinctive in us, right? that cues are going to the ventral tegmental area, but guess what is there? What are the receptors on the ventral tegmental area? It's nicotinic receptors. So nicotine acts as an external ligand to these receptors. Notice I use the word nicotine and I'm not using the word, I'm not using the word cigarettes alone. So nicotine from combustible, tobacco products from combustible tobacco products goes to the brain in six seconds, goes to this ventral tegmental area, goes and attaches itself to those nicotinic receptors and now acts as an external ligand for safety. It then promotes this feeling of safety in the brain. It helps expand the number of receptors and at the same time, it desensitizes the receptors. So it's a very fascinating thing. And it is the only, only product right now which does it. So that is why it creates the sensation of, my God, something is happening to me. And this leads to the next problem, which usually is the compulsion. So what happens in the compulsion is that now that it has acted as an external ligand and it tells the brain, as long as you're seeing me, you are fine, you feel safe. Any time that they try to stop smoking, it creates something called as a negative prediction error. And that negative prediction error is so strong that it creates a compulsion that pe people have to pick up the cigarette unconsciously and start smoking again. So this is why when you tell people set a quit date, it's just so false because it is literally impossible for people to set a quit date and stick to it because of this effect on the brain. So what does it mean when I say that there is connections between environment and behavior? What I mean is that nicotine is very well known to 
actually be able to know where you smoke. So if you get up in the morning, switch on your coffee and smoke, it's going to give you that cue every morning like an Alexa and it will tell you, you know, it's time to do this. It's time tell to do me that. Anything you're comfortable with me knowing. Alexa, stop. See, my Alexa is talking. Um, so that's what nicotine does, right? It is very, very powerful and it kind of gives those cues every time. So it, it, it knows if you're going to the coffee shop in the morning, drinking your coffee and smoking, it will give you that cue every time, which is why patients who smoke, sometimes when they come to the hospital, they don't really want to smoke as much. They are not that they are not necessarily running outside and wanting to smoke all the time. Some patients do, but not all the time. And if you go to a different environment, that urge to smoke is not there. So it is actually being studied in monkeys and this compulsion is very, very strong. And all this happens because of all the glutaminergic pathways, the dopaminergic pathways, to the prefrontal cortex, which is in responsible for the executive function, the nucleus accumbens, the hippocampus, the ventral tegmental area, the amygdala, all these together are forming this. Remember, nicotine addiction is the only addiction where the person is fully functional. You do not ever recognize that this person is, you do not look at a person who smokes and says they are an addict. They don't, they're fully functional, they have high IQs, they are able to do everything, but it is an addiction and it is a chronic disease. So the connection to emotion and stress again is related completely to the mesolimbic dopaminergic system, which controls the whole emotion, motivation, memory. So the minute they get stressed out, they'll pick up a cigarette because it calms them down, calms them down. So the cigarette is a highly engineered nicotine delivery device system. And actually so is the electronic nicotine device systems. So this treatise from William Dunn from Phillips Morris clearly said that the nicotine, the puff of smoke is the vehicle of nicotine. It is dispensing nicotine and smoke beyond question is the most optimized vehicle of nicotine and the cigarette is the most optimized dispenser of smoke. So how did this happen? It happened when he tried to tell them that, hey, nicotine causes addiction. And they said, so be it. If it makes them smoke more, this is the best thing in the world. So he discovered long time back and he wrote a book long time back about the fact that what we are doing and what we are delivering is nicotine. So what is there in a cigarette? There's, I have the anatomy of the cigarette. So there is nicotine, there is menthol, you know, targeting the black population. There are ventilated filters. There are sugars and aldehydes, which is why it doesn't taste as bitter as it should. There are organic salts, there are nitrosinamines, and there is ammonia. Ammonia is key because ammonia is responsible for converting nicotine to a highly alkaline form, which then goes easily to the, through the alveolar capillary membrane and goes to the brain real quick. So this is more on the anatomy of the cigarette and you can also see it has many other products which it should not have. And then addiction, it's not just an addiction and that is the problem in how we deal with it. We never ask our patients with hypertension and diabetes that should we treat you or are you ready to quit hypertension or quit diabetes? That's not how we talk about it. We say, here are what you need to do to take care of your high blood pressure and diabetes. So that is how we need to start approaching smoking or nicotine use because it is a chronic disease. And why is it a chronic disease? This is why it's a chronic disease because smoking cues, stress relates, uh, results in craving. You, you smoke, there's a nicotine spike. There are activated nicotine acetylcholine receptors. 
but immediately they're also desensitized. Then it creates an acute tolerance. Then it creates reduced levels of dopamines. Then it causes withdrawal symptoms. Then it increases craving. And then this goes on and on and on. And as you can see, these activated receptors also cause neural plasticity. They cause conditional learning. They release dopamine. And the most fascinating part of this is if your parents smoked and if a child is exposed to parents who smoke, they release something called as Delta Force B, which is a nanoparticle, which makes the neural pathways start in the brain as a child, which then makes them much more prone to getting into nicotine addiction. In addition, all these pathways, neural pathways that are created by nicotine addiction do not go down, doesn't decrease the number of receptors, none of them decrease even if you stop smoking. And you know that 10 times increase in nicotine receptors happens usually within 10 days. So it's kind of scary what nicotine does. And these are the long-term changes it does, nerve connections, density, increased sensitivity of the receptors, it desensitizes them and it increases the sensitivity in the sense that it, much more nicotine is required now to, sense, uh, to make them give the dopamine and it changes gene expression, which is what is responsible for some people being able to quit more easily than the others. So here are our myths. Quit date, come back when you're ready. Today, you're not ready to talk about it, but come back next time we'll talk about it. Nicotine replacement therapy, that is a patch or gum or lozenge or uh, inhaler or nasal spray cannot be used while smoking. Patients have control over their smoking habits. Shaming helps, that is we've made, rightfully so, we've made every indoor space smoke free but have we definitely given them designated places or designated times to be able to go and try to smoke? I'm not saying promote smoking, but if people have been smoking all their lives, this is not going to be easy. So as much as we are trying to make sure that we do not get exposed to secondhand smoke, and we are saying that smoking is bad. We do need to take care of the subset of people. And then the victimization. And when I am saying victimization, it's like how many of you have referred to a person with tobacco use disorder as a smoker? I'm sure quite a few of you have done that, right? I used to do that. I absolutely used to do that till I learned so much more about tobacco. And I was like, I was ashamed of myself or a vapor, right? These are not terms we should use. And that is why I use the term tobacco use disorder. So let's talk about vaping for a minute. Um, so it's, it's a use of an electronic device that vaporizes a liquid to be inhaled by the user. These are the types of vaping. And again, I know that you guys have had a entire grand rounds on this. I'm not going to go la 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 about it. As you all know, it has a mouthpiece, a clear tank, a heating coil. The things about vaping is even if people tell you they're only having marijuana as a vaping use disorder, that still contains nicotine. So the FDA actually did many, 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 many tests of many products. And they found that products with say no nicotine or it's only a marijuana only product still contains nicotine. But the same FDA now has approved that product, use product to help people stop smoking, even though the literature for it is very haywire and not at all consistent. Uh, it contains not only nicotine, it contains heavy metals, it contains carcinogens, the tank systems can increase environmental exposure and the sweet flavors contain diacetyl and acetylpropanol. So aldehydes, which are bad for you, 
vegetable glycerin, propylene glycol, which forms aldehydes like acrolein. And why is acrolein bad? Because it actually impairs chloride secretion, and that is the cystic fibrosis-like picture. The heating coils contain metal fumes, which are bad for you. The vitamin E acetate and ketene, as you know, is bad for you. And all these lead to acute lung injury. So the data is not only the vaping associated pulmonary injury, there is other things like we are seeing more patients with a reactive airway disease. We are definitely seeing more patients with obstructive lung disease. Even in a younger population, I have both a 16 year old with uh, air trapping already with the RV of 230% with vaping alone. So this is not bad, this is not good. And there is enough data now that it does increase the risk of heart attacks too. Now there is another new thing on the market during COVID because they can't keep quiet during COVID. So they had to come up with something else. Oh, don't vape, instead use us because we are better. We are real tobacco. We are naturally present in tobacco and we are not smoking. We are not ashing. It's just a heated product. So these are the new products in the market. Uh, please look at your children's backpacks, see if they have anything like this because these are the new, this is the new fancy for everybody. So the traditional way to approach uh, any person with tobacco use disorder is you ask them about it, you advise them to quit, you assess their willingness to make a quit attempt, you arrange a follow-up and you assist in the quit attempt. Awesome, it doesn't work. So I would tell you all to get this new approach that is create a cognitive awareness, tell people, make people understand the effect of nicotine. What I usually tell them is the brain is like a dog. Most of the dogs love bacon. I think all dogs, I'm not a dog owner, so correct me if I'm wrong. Dogs love bacon. Bacon is our cigarettes, okay? So the brain, which is a dog, loves bacon, which is the cigarettes. Now you want to get the dog on a healthy diet of broccoli. So what do you do? You cannot give the dog broccoli because it's going to spit, spit it out and it's like, I don't want this. So you're going to give it bacon covered broccoli. So you approach it not like I'm going to give you broccoli. That is, I'm going to make you stop smoking today, but I'm going to give you something so that your brain still thinks it's something, it's still, still seeing the nicotine and it feels happy. The other thing I tell my patients, which has a big effect is I tell them nicotine is like somebody who's pretending to be your BFF, your best friend. They come and live with you, but as they are living with you and enjoying your hospitality, they steal from you and they steal the entire house from you. So nicotine, while it makes your brain feel supremely safe and awesomely st stress-free, takes away everything of meaning from every organ in your body. So that's what I tell, uh, tell them and I try to make them understand. I spent quite some time talking about the biology of nicotine and the hijacking the survival instincts. Um, correct their tendency to sabotage, take baby steps, anticipate ex escape, offer questions instead of answers. And then everybody has a different style. So tend to their style and aggressively control their compulsion to smoke, aggressively. Okay. I, I apologize for all these. I should have taken them out. I thought I'd taken it out, but clearly I didn't. Okay, so they have this disordered motivation and compulsion. That is ambivalence. They're hesitant. I desperately want to quit smoking, but not today, not now. You know, Thanksgiving is coming. Let's do it after Thanksgiving. I'm just too stressed out with Thanksgiving. I've got to, you know, make the turkey and everything. It's going to be terrible. So I don't want to do it now. And then there is this two-headed llama, right? And I love this uh, cartoon that says, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising or being dead, right? But that doesn't work, right? So they're going to tell you, doc, I stopped smoking, but then I wanted to test myself. So I went and got myself one cigarette to see if I could still do it 
but then I ended up going and buying a pack of cigarettes. So they're going to do this to themselves. They're going to find escape. They're going to tell you multiple barriers and they always have a low grade panic and they're going to sabotage themselves. They're going to do this again and again and again. The other thing you have to remember, and I talk to people about it a lot, is the Odysseus effect, which is very classic with nicotine. And for those of you who know Greek mythology, Odysseus was a person who thought he could do everything. He was his own person. He was told not to respond to the siren's call because he would be dead. But he said, I won't be dead because I'm going to be attached to the mast right there. And nothing is going to happen to me. But all of you who have read Greek mythology, which is not me, I read the Odysseus effect, but that said, no, that bad things came to Odysseus. So that is what nicotine does. It makes you do rash things, which you know are bad for you. So they're, it's very strong in them. So you have to talk to your patients about it. You have to motivate them more than disincentivizing them. And that is the only way to go. There, these are the rules of the motivational interviewing. Don't tell them what to do. Understand what is motivating them. Listen with empathy, empower them. But this by itself is not enough. You need to also do some aggressive treatment. So cigarettes per day is not, and packs per day are not the way of going about the dose of smoke because the nicotine yield of the cigarette, number of puffs, frequency of puffs, volume of puffs, puff depth, duration of hold, all play an effect. Each cigarette actually can deliver anywhere from one to about 14 milligrams of nicotine. So that's a lot of nicotine. There is a stepwise approach for tobacco dependence severity. And usually if you have two or more medical conditions and or uh, one psychiatric condition, right, then and you have a high phagostom nicotine dependence uh, scale, then you will fall in severe or very severe disease. In all the days that I have been doing this, I have yet to see someone who's healthy medically and healthy psychiatrically and not had anything else so what I'm trying to say is nearly everyone who comes through my door is either severe or very severe tobacco dependence. There is a stepwise approach. So not just asthma has a stepwise approach to doing it. Tobacco use disorder also has a stepwise approach to doing it. So when you're severe or very severe, you need to use controller and reliever medications Sometimes you need to use multiple controllers. So let's talk about the medications. So what are our controller medications? We have nicotine patch, which is seven milligram, 14 milligram, 21 milligram. Don't bother with the low patches. Please start your patients on 21 milligram unless they are intolerant of it. Uh, Velbutrin, that is bupropion, uh, 150 milligrams, a sustained release, uh, the Varniclin, Shantix, 0.5 and 1 milligram, these are your controller medications. Your reliever medications are your gum, lozenges, mini lozenges, um, nicotine nasal spray, and our best friend, the nicotine inhaler. Why isn't there a nicotine pill? Because it undergoes first pass metabolism and for the amount of nicotine pill that has been taken orally, it'll cause serious side effects. So that is why there is no pill. There's the patch, the gum is not meant to be chewed on. You're supposed to soften it and park it between your teeth and your cheek. The lozenge, you cannot suck on it because if you ever suck on a lozenge, it tastes disgusting. You're supposed to just park it between your cheek and your um, gum. The nasal spray, you can use it. And then there is the oral inhaler, which we really, really like and our patients like. They're really, it's really works. You're supposed to kind of suck on it like how we are sucking on a straw. You're not supposed to take big breaths. I tried it out and I took a big breath and my tobacco coach, Julia Melamad, saw how 
disgusted I was and how I was wheezing for quite some time after that. So that thing is very harsh if you take a nice and deep breath. So that's not how you, you're supposed to use it. So the things to remember for us is that the baseline nicotine levels produced by smoking are higher than the patch. The levels of nicotine are six to 10 times higher in smokers and vapors than any patch and gum use. And this is with them smoking. So all the data I'm telling you is with them smoking. And because of the fast delivery in smoking, the cardiovascular effects are much, much, much higher in patients who use cigarettes instead of nicotine replacement therapy. And patients who use nicotine replacement therapy continue to smoke just produce their baseline nicotine levels, not higher. So let us take away our traditional teaching which says, do not smoke with a patch. It is incorrect. The patch will not work if you do not smoke with it. Uh, Bropropion tablet twice a day or Zyban, uh, its average seizure rate with this is still less then one is to 1000. I have shown you some of the things that are in there, which they talk about medications, which lower the seizure threshold. I am forever um, talking to both the psychiatrist and the neurologist saying that the seizure threshold lowering with this is still very low, but I do, do not pick this as my first medication in patients of known seizure uh, disorder. Uh, of course, hepatic impairment, of course, pregnancy, adolescence, there's no data for this at all. And the emergent neuropsychiatric system, actually that has been debunked by the trial, the most recent trial, which is the Eagles trial, which looked at nicotine replacement therapy, looked at placebo, looked at uh, Shantix and looked at Belbutrin and found that the neuropsychiatric effects were same in everything, including placebo. And there was no increased uptake of neuropsychiatric effects or any other effects in any of this. And that Shantix was truly the best medication in helping people stop smoking. Again, I have no financial connection with Pfizer. And in fact, I don't let Pfizer come anywhere near us at all. Um, so Varniclin or Epo Varniclin, because as you know, currently there's a Shantix recall going on because some of their, uh, some of their Shantix tablets were, I mean, uh, capsules were kind of uh, um, uh, contaminated with uh, nitrosinamine. So because of that, Shantix is on a recall, which is a really bad thing for us because our patients who are doing very well are relaxing. And there is apovarmiclin available. This is the Canadian generic form of it. So it is available. However, not all pharmacies are carrying it. The biggest problem with this is nausea. Nausea, nausea, nausea. You have to tell patients, that they need to take it with food. That means they need to go to IHOP and eat a breakfast and take it not like a banana or not like a bar or something. They really need to eat full breakfast. And it works as the agonist antagonist, right? It works on the nicotine acetylcholine receptors and it is very, very good in terms of both providing relief from the craving and the withdrawal symptoms. So this is a very good um, uh, uh, update on looking at all the medications. You can see here the bupropion, the nicotine gum, the nicotine inhaler, varnaclin. And you can see that clearly varnaclin is really, really good in getting people for abstinence rates. So is the nicotine nasal spray. The nicotine patch for six to 14 weeks also works very well and the nicotine inhaler, but clearly Varnaclin takes the best thing. We really don't use clonidin or uh, nortriptyline. And you can see that if you use the patch with uh, other reliever medications, it really has one of the best effects. Patch, we use even Varnaclin with other medications that was not studied here. 
So our clinic, uh, it's funded through the state grant, um, thanks to the Center of Tobacco Prevention and Control. It is a visit with a lung doctor, me, and a tobacco coach, I, uh, Julia Malamad, who I think is on the call, and our nurse practitioner currently, who also runs a lung cancer screening. We discuss about the good, bad, and ugly of our tobacco journey. We assess the severity of tobacco dependence, we do patient-directed treatment methods and we continue support with the tobacco coach and we use controller and reliever medications. So here is a small summary of the patients we are seeing. Older patients, as you can see, for, uh, older patients 65 plus is not our major group. Our major group is actually 45 to 64. Predominantly black population, predominantly from the lower socioeconomic status. Um, and that is their insurance mix. A lot of different comorbidities that we are seeing here. Um, we started in, this is data from 2019 to July, 2021. So patients who had less than 170 days follow-up and patients who had more than 170 day follow-ups, you can see that we have manage to get people to get abstinent and quit and cutting down, which is important for us. And same here. And I will show you the rates of uh, being more uh, abstinent, which happens with compliance of medications. We have the scale system where we look at what action stage of tobacco dependence they are in, the positive or the neutral forms are if they are accepting, they are acting on direction, they have early abstinence, they're changing their routine or self-directed abstinence and the negative ones are right here. And as you can see here, what happens is that when they have compliance with their medications, whether it's partial compliance or complete compliance, then they are much more likely to cut down or be abstinent. Let me shift gears to COVID for a second. Higher smoking in the progression group with COVID and than the recovery go, uh, group, higher case fatality rates uh, in males and females. And this is data from China, which is thought to be related to smoking. Um, and basically higher rates of COVID in men in Italy, Spain and China were thought to be because of smoking and they are much more likely to contract other respiratory infections. Here is why, because this is a non-smoker and here is how we look in terms of our mucociliary clearance and our permeability and our ability to uh, have lower spread of viruses and effective immunity. Clearly you can see that what happens with COVID and with smoking is that it produces more ACE2. So there's impaired mucociliary clearance, more ACE2 receptors leading to the cytokine storm. So I think I have told you a lot about nicotine and its effect on the brain. I've told you that ENDS is the old epidemic because we now have more heated tobacco products. We need to stop shaming and start healing. It is an important part of what we need to do. It is not cessation because cessation means it's a one-sided effect. That means only your patient is supposed to take an effort. You as a provider, do not need to take an effort. So it is treatment, it's a liberation. The treatments are mostly safe and can be used for extended periods and I'm happy to take questions on it. Typically we use uh, Shantix for at least three months and up to six months and nicotine patches, we've used it much longer than that. Uh, higher severity definitely requires a step up therapy and nicotine use, possibly increases the risk of COVID-19 intensity. And also uh, what I did not share with you is some of the vaping data, which also does that. So that is our clinic. Uh, that's our website. You can uh, click on the website and you'll be able to find us. 
uh, tobacco coach, Julia Malamad, who has been there with me from the inception and who is really the backbone of this program. Our patients love her, talking to her. Uh, we provide medication assistance. So we have nicotine patches and other nicotine replacement therapy, thanks to the grant that we are able to give them not nicotine inhaler because it's a prescription medication, but we also uh, connect them to things like the Pfizer program, which allows nicotine inhalers to be given to them free of cost, depending on their income. We do virtual and text coaching and education. Uh, the follow-up visits are usually eight to 12 weeks. And I would like us all to think about stopping smoking more in this manner, in a more positive manner than in the negative played ads, played short ads, or horribly wrinkled women and things like that. So that's all I got. So I'm going to stop sharing now.